welcome everyone. My name is Jeff Cranford and uh, we are so excited. I, let me tell you something. I think the whole community is excited about the interview that I'm going to do today with one of my precious friends, uh, part of one of our Lynx Fellowship groups uh, that's at a place called the Hideaway Club. It's here in La Quinta, California. We actually have the privilege of being in uh, John's home today. This is John Griffith. His precious wife, Shirley, is already out on the golf course. So she's, John says she only plays three or four days a week. So uh, Shirley's out playing golf. And I said, I had met with John last week. I said, John, I just want to hear your story. And John, as, we, as you started to unpack a little bit of it, and John's a, a quiet, precious, uh, just no-nonsense kind of guy, but I had to drag some of this out of him. But he was willing, and as I was thinking about it, I said, I said, we have to share this with our community. So, John, thank you so much for your willingness, not only to open your home, but open your story to Hope us. Hope we don't disappoint you. Well, there will be no disappointment <laughs> in this because I know the story. So we're going to start. I'm going to kind of look at this, John, in three different ways. We're going to talk a little bit about your golf background uh, and your golf life because a, a lot of these folks are golfers. And we're going to talk a little bit about something, your transition period that happened to you, an extraordinary event that happened to you through actually a plane crash. And then we'll talk a little bit about your business life and how Jesus has kind of invaded your life. So let's go back. I want to talk a little bit just about golf because you are a member so you're a number of different clubs, but primarily you played most of your golf at the legendary Shady Oaks. Can you tell us just a little bit about Shady Oaks and your golf life at Shady Oaks? Shady Oaks is a neat little club in Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of the nicest things about it, uh, we had a member there that uh, you'd be interested in. His name was Ben Hogan. Ben Hogan. Ben Hogan. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. A mythological figure, really. I mean. Yeah. And. Um, I had the good fortune of uh, uh, being invited by Ben to start playing some golf with him uh, quite a number of years ago, close to the end of his competitive. So he would have probably been early 50s, late 40s? Yeah, yeah so. toward the end of his competitive. And you had a couple other guys, you said, that played in this group. They had this kind of had this standing group that were really good players, too. Yeah. We're all Good, and Ben invited us to play with him. You didn't invite him to play. <laughs> yeah, he had to do the inviting, right? He, he was a little particular about who he played with. Yeah. So uh, we had some good times. And uh, <clears throat> I think I told you the first time that uh, this group ever played with Ben. Yes. <clears throat> we were on the first tee at Shady Oaks, and Ben was... Uh, kind of making the game. Right. And so I listened to that for a minute and I said, <laughs> Ben, do, do you need some money? <laughs> and he kind of laughed, but he was pretty serious. <laughs> I said, uh, if you do, I'll give you some. But Ben, this game you've arranged is not fair. <laughs> and anyway, every t single time, that we played after that, he would say, John, you make the game. Because oh, I love that. I love that. And I did a little reconnaissance on this because Hollis Sullivan, who's part of our community and actually mm -hmm. on the national board uh, as well, is a member at Shady Oaks. Right. And I mentioned something to him about you. And he goes, oh, my gosh. He goes, he played with Hogan. He, he, and Hollis's words were, all these people claim this relationship with Ben Hogan, that they knew Ben Hogan, that they had the secret. He said, John never talks about it, but he actually played more golf with Ben Hogan. Than about. So he gave, he gave the full backup. He actually played a lot of golf with Ben Hogan. So those are extraordinary. Are there any other stories can you can tell us about Ben or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something. <clears throat> I think, Jeff, that... Um, about his the side of Ben. Yes. The, very few people saw. Yeah. Um, when he got to where he was old, older and yes. didn't play competitively, he'd come out to Shady Oaks and he would have uh, lunch. And in addition to his lunch, he'd have several drinks. Right, right. And, and he had a legendary spot that he yeah, sat and everything corner, looked out the over the, the yeah, club. Yeah. So he'd have his drinks, and then he'd get a putter in his hand, 
And he'd go for a walk around the back nine. Right. Just being in his putter. And one day, <clears throat> one day I was playing out there and um, with some guys, and we were getting ready to, uh, the 13th and 15th holes run. Run side, side by side, side okay. By uh -huh. side uh -huh. Opposite direction. And we were getting ready to play the 14th hole, and Ben came from the 13th fairway going across 14th. So we Just stopped, walking right across the fairway. Walking right, right across the fairway ahead of us. And we, we stopped and uh, watched him go across. And he got over into the 15 fairway, and uh, he stopped. And he kind of spread his legs out. And then he started twisting in a circle. Wow. And threw his hands up in the air and fell over backwards. And uh, I started trying to run toward him to uh, see what had happened. Sure. And before I could get to him, the green superintendent happened to be riding by, and he picked, picked Ben up, took him in the club. Wow. And you, you're <clears> thinking <throat> he's had a stroke or no, something. No, I mean, no he didn't. Had. Right, right. So um, we got through playing, and I asked, when we got into the club, uh, Shady Oaks, uh, where Ben was, they said, well, somebody had driven him home. He lived close there. And that night, I got to thinking about what I had seen. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, I bet you that sucker didn't, didn't tell Valerie what had happened. To didn't him. tell his wife, yeah. 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 So I picked up the phone and I called uh, and got Valerie on the phone. And I said, Valerie, uh, I don't know. I just, this is just something you need to know. And I told her about what we'd seen happen to Ben. Right. And I said, all I'm calling you for is to tell you, watch him carefully and be sure he's all right. Mm. So the very next afternoon, I was out on the little nine where Ben and I used to go, the two of us, practice. Right. And I was hitting practice balls, and I looked out across there. And I saw Ben coming toward me, and I said, oh, my gracious. Oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> a little longer lines of, what are you doing <laughs> messing with me? Sure, sure. So anyway, I hit about two more balls, and he was right on course making a beeline for me. Oh, John. So he comes up, and I said, well, here it comes. I'll just take it. You can and, it's uh, right here. Yeah, and got, yeah. yeah. So Ben came walking up. He got right in front of me. He grabbed me. With, hit I've seen hands. those hands. Yeah, yeah. 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 He grabbed me. And he was about this far apart and just staring at me. Well, when Ben looked at you, you knew you'd been looked at. <laughs> oh, man. And I was just. I think stop breathing right for the right thing to hit. And he said, John, he said, I want to tell you how much it means to me to have a friend like you who thought enough of me to do what you did when you called Valerie. Wow. Wow. Not what you were expecting. <laughs> no. Uh, I almost cry when I think about it. Wow. Uh, that's, that was a sign to Ben Hogan that almost nobody ever saw. Wow. Wow. That's a precious story. That is because he's known the Hawk, you know, <laughs> he just, uh, <laughs> just like a Ray Floyd look, all those guys, you know, yeah. that steely look. And so that is an incredible story. I appreciate so much you sharing that with us. Um, I, you know, one other thing about, and, and again, I, I've met with you. You never even told me. I kind of came down through the grapevine, but, but you were also, you've been a member at Augusta for how many years? Long time. Long time. I, you, I was on the Penn City committee. Penn City. So the guys go out, you get a committee to determine where 
The impossible <laughs> place will be this yeah, year. For those do it pit. every day, every morning before. Every morning play. before the round. And um, how many years? Well, I was on the committee for 41 years. 41 years on the pin setting committee. And I was uh, put on the committee by Mr. Roberts when he invited me to become a member. Wow. Wow. So, and, uh, that's a, it was a long time. That was awesome. I bet you, 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 so you were there for some of the great historical golf moments through the yeah. years. I mean, uh, such a storied place as Augusta. Well, John, you're, I mean, obviously your golf pedigree, your involvement in the game, you know, I think, I think for many of us, we can say it very much becomes like our community. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. It becomes family. It's the niche in which we live. But, you know, I want to get to your life and your spiritual journey for sure. But what led to your spiritual journey? You'd run pretty fast and hard. You'd, you'd made some money as a young man, and you were doing some big game hunting in Africa, as I understand it. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened and then what this momentous occasion was that really brought about, it grabbed you and changed your life? Right. Well, I had been um, in the Central African Republic. Okay which is uh, right in the center of Africa, yes. right above Zaire. Right above Zaire. And um, we had concluded our hunt, and we were going to fly back into the big city, Bangui. Okay, the okay. Name of it, from which we'd catch a plane and go home. And uh, I noticed when I got in the plane uh, that there was a... a container of gasoline hmm. in, inside. Uh, I, I didn't think too much about it at the time, but right. uh, I did later. Sure. So I, I was uh, in the plane. There was a pilot. This was a Cessna 210. The pilot, to the right of the pilot, was my best friend, a man named John Howell. John Howell? Okay. John Howell was... Um, a uh, bomber pilot during World wow. War II. Wow. So you felt like you are in pretty good hands yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. He was shot down behind enemy, enemy lines twice. Wow. <clears throat> Same way. And right across from me in the back seat was a little, uh, little native boy uh, that we were taking in to the, the doctor. Okay. He, he'd never been in the airplane before. Okay. And uh, so we, we, <clears throat> flew for about an hour, and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, John turns around to me and he says, uh, "Tighten up your seatbelt real tight." And I said, "What's wrong?" He said, "The engine isn't running." He said, "We're going to crash." So we were get, uh, get the, getting ready to land on this strip way out in the middle of the forest. And the strip was uh, cut out of the brush and trees, uh, narrow, and about 100 yards long. 100 yards. So. What's going through your head when you hear something like that? I mean, is well, your, your heart's you, pounding out of your chest? Well, you start, you know, I never, I never got afraid, but I knew I had to try to do something as quick as I could. Right. So it wasn't long until we had gone into these trees short of the runway. The trees were about eight inches in diameter and pretty tall and mm. very thick. Uh, they were so thick it, you would have had difficulty walking through them. Oh, my goodness, yeah. So it, real, real quickly, we hit those trees. Fortunately, the pilot didn't hit anything with the nose. If he had, we'd all been dead. He'd been dead, yeah. Uh, but he stuck it in between some of the trees, and we went down. And it was just bam, bam, bam. One jar impact after another. Ended up uh, tore the wings off the plane which is what uh, slowed us down. So both the wings completely gone. Both, both so you just got the fuselage. Yeah. And so as the plane was 
hopefully coming to an end, stop. I started trying to get the door open because I knew we were going to have to get out of there. Sure. And I couldn't get the door open. Uh, ended up cutting my hand mm. trying to get it open. So I'm pounding on the door, and John Howell, a cool customer he was, turns around and says, well, Griff, why don't you see if you can get, up, get out the other side? So I couldn't get out the side that we were on because it was bent. Right, right. And so we, we opened the door on the other side, and I was able to kick it with my foot, and that's how we were able to get out. And that's how you got out. So we get out, and um, we start walking away, and the pilot said, well, is everybody okay? And I looked at him, and he had his nose cut, and blood was running down his face. And I said, well, you're not okay. And he looked at me, and he said, well, you're not either. He said, you've got blood all running down your pant leg, mm. which was from my hand. From your hand I didn't yeah. feel it. He didn't right, feel right. it. Right, right. You got so much adrenaline, you don't, you're not even. So there. anyway, uh, we got it stopped, and they came, some people came from the little village and t- said, come with us. And uh, So this could be good or bad at this yeah, point, right? There was, there was a little, uh, <clears throat> a little, uh, white building there with a screen coming off the door windows. Right. And they took us there, and that's where we were going to have the Le Doctor. Le Doctor. Le Doctor <laughs> yeah. come see us. Well, the Doctor comes, sees us, and he wanted to sew my hand up. Right. I didn't want him to no. do that. Yeah. I have a good infection. I mean, there's no doubt. So, so um, he... We were having kind of an argument about who was going to do what. And he grabbed my hand with these forces and gave it a jerk and ripped a big hunk of skin off. And with that, I sat down. Anyway, I got him to wrap my hand up, not so, but wrap it up. And uh, so we left, and we walked away from the doctor's building, and they came and got us. They were, going to, they were having a hearing before a, hearing. A, a, a little military base they had there. <clears throat> and so we go walking in there and sit down, and there was a gathering of these young men that uh, up at the front where this military guy was holding this hearing. And um, it's a French-speaking nation. And at that time, and to this day, not much, I don't speak much French, but I could tell that things weren't going real well. And just then, the door opens up. So they're, what are they going to do? Are they going to shake you down? Are they yeah, gonna, I, I mean, think, is that I what's probably going to happen? The object was that they were going to shake us down, maybe find, find us. Find you or crash it. Wow. So, so the door opens, and this uh, statuesque, handsome black woman comes walking through the door. And she walks up to the front of the, where they're having that little get-together. Right. And she starts talking to those boys that were clustered around there trying to shake us down. She was shaking her finger at them. And you have no idea who this is. She just she just emerges. No. I didn't know who it was. And uh, pretty soon the boys that she were talking to tucked their tails and ran. Ran away. And then she took us to her home where it was uh, obvious that we were going to have to have a, wait for another airplane to come pick us up. And uh, she was so nice and gave us something, to, water and something to drink. And I noticed, toward, and she was incredibly kind to us, people she'd never seen never before, knew. Yeah. Never, yeah. never will see again. Wow. And I noticed that she had a little gold cross Hanging her around her neck. Wow. So Which, that's your only connection. Just yep. kindness, humility, saved you out of the situation. 
and a gold cross. Yeah, which uh, made me think that uh, maybe God had saved me mm. for some reason. Wow, wow. And, uh, so at this time, you're not walking with the Lord at this time. I mean, no. you're, you're running a pretty fast track. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about him. Right. All I was interested in at the time was making money. And I uh, knew, uh, knew who Jesus was, but I did not know him. Mm. All I knew was trying to... But now you've got a picture. Yeah. Now you've got a picture personified through this woman who emerges after, one, after a plane crash. And then, anyway, I decided that I'd been saved. And uh, we flew home. And that's when I started through seven years of Bible study fellowship. Bible study. So this had such a profound impact on you. You're not walking with the Lord. You're kind of a, have a God consciousness and awareness, but you're a million miles from him. You have this experience. She never talks to you about Jesus. She just sees, you just see the cross and you go back to Fort Worth, a different man, and you immediately start with Bible study fellowship for seven years. Yeah. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, figured out I learned something. <laughs> wow, wow. Never a contact with this woman again? No. I don't know her name. She was, uh, she was married to the only uh, white man in that area who was a diamond buyer. For the De Beers diamond, a company. diamond buyer for De Beers. That's all you knew. You mm -hmm. never was a, the impact she had on your life. I mean, I mean, this is a lesson in and of itself. Knowing that, as Jesus said, "Let your you know your light shine before men, that they might see your Father in heaven and glorified." I mean, it's, I mean, she she probably has no idea the impact she's had not only in your life but then the downline of all that's happened in your life since. Yeah. That's a great story, John. And an encouraging story, sometimes mm -hmm. just an act of obedience and kindness associated with Christ has a profound effect. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so you get back to Fort Worth, you, you start investing your life, not just in going to church or, you know, being, but you're actually studying the word through Bible study fellowship, through mm -hmm. small group and through Bible study, uh, which is certainly very much what we love and, and value. Uh, so... Let's now go into the business world. I want to I want to look a little bit at what had happened. Now, how does God invade your business life? Can you tell us some stories from? I mean, there was a traumatic thing that happened in business in the eighties. You you were in the banking business. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I, I had uh, after uh, after I graduated from the University of Texas, I went into the Navy. I was a, a supply officer. Okay. And then, then when I got out of the Navy, <clears throat> I went to work as an assistant bank examiner for the state of Texas. Okay. And um, through, through that connection, I've, I went to work for a small bank in downtown Fort Worth. Okay. And this roughly what year would this have uh, been? Uh, late 80s. Okay. And uh, the bank was tiny. It had too many employees. And it wasn't run well, and it wasn't making any money. Those were not good things. It's not a good company. <laughs> so anyway, I got went to work in that bank. And a short time after I got there, the uh, executive officer that was running the bank uh, left and went to work at the First National Bank in Fort Worth, who, which was the second biggest bank in Fort Worth. Okay. So there I was. And they finally puttered around for a while and then decided to make me president of the bank when I was 25. Wow. So <laughs> that is amazing. So... Uh, uh, the bank began to improve. It began to grow nicely. Uh, started making money. We were doing quite well. And we had another bank that was bigger than ours out in West Texas. 
uh, approaches. They said they didn't have enough loan demand. Okay. And uh, wanted to know if we would uh, generate some larger loans that they could participate with us. Okay. And we said that, uh, yeah, we'd do it. And in addition to, uh, I had two younger brothers that were bankers, and their bank participated in some of these same loans. So things were going fine. And then the banking situation in Texas began to fall apart. It was, um, it was just, it was just horrible. Uh, so now everybody's subject it, to maybe bankruptcy or yeah, yeah. it was it was terrible, and we uh, big banks, every bank in Texas was going through these these problems, and uh, it turned out that uh, after a number of years and things began to fall apart, uh, I was. I was afraid that our bank was going to go broke. It was going to go broke. Yeah. And I made up my mind that I was going to sell our home and uh, if I had to. Right. And put the money from the sale of the home into the bank mm. before I mm. let it fail. And uh, <sighs> I remember how terrible it was uh, with the, the loan portfolio just literally falling apart. Everything, yeah. I'd go to sleep. I'd sleep for two hours, maybe wake up, mm. think about if there's something that I'd overlooked that would help some of these people that were going to lose everything. And it was, it was horrible. And the harder I worked, the worse it got. Mm. And finally, out of desperation, I got down on my hands and knees mm. and asked Jesus to help me and told him that I wanted to trust him to be my Lord and Savior. Wow. So this is not, this is not just theory. I mean, this is rubber meets the road. Hands and knees, Jesus, mm -hmm. I need help. Mm -hmm. Isn't it, it amazing how, John, sometimes most often it's when we have hit our end that yeah. we reach out. Oh, we're doing fine. Everything's fine. Oh, yeah. it's, it takes a plane crash. It takes a catastrophic business failure, maybe a cancer diagnosis or something. But Jesus and his infinite grace was there. Well, well what happened? Well... <clears throat> The bank began to have an, an amazing turnaround. Just by coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now, how many banks were there in Fort Worth at this point? Well, there were, there were 11 banks and savings and loans in downtown Fort in Worth. In downtown Fort Worth. Yeah. Turned out that uh, we were the only one. You're the only one. That made it through those. We were four, the fourth one in size. When fourth we, in size out of 11, and the only one that either wasn't bought out or got, gone bankrupt? Yeah. So, coincidence. We made it. <laughs> Turnaround. And it, as you look back, it's, it's, you didn't change necessarily what you were doing, other than here's what you changed. You get down on your knees. Yeah. That's right. Wow. And then about that time, when things were falling apart, the uh, West Texas Bank that had called us, wanted us to generate some loans, <clears throat> decided they didn't like the loans, uh, which the loans weren't any good. Sure. And uh, so they decided they were going to sue us, mm. which they did. So... Things got better, but things also were still challenging, which is life, yeah. right? And uh, they had the bad loans. We had a bunch of bad loans. My two brothers' banks had a bunch of bad loans. Uh, we were swallowing ours, although it wasn't fun. Uh, but they decided that they were going to sue us. So they got a lawyer on uh, 
a basis where they wouldn't owe him unless he unless recovered. he wins. Yeah. So a little shady. Yeah. So anyway, I, we we had about three weeks in the middle of the summer in in the court in downtown Fort Worth where I, has, I sat there and heard them talk about how bad we were, and I couldn't do anything but sit there and listen. And finally, we came to the end of it, and the jury took it, and in about 15 minutes, the jury... Uh, Comes back with a verdict? It came, yeah. 15 they, minutes can be they, either really good or really bad, yeah, right? They, they, <laughs> they, they, they held in our favor on 17, all 17 different counts. And interestingly, turned out that the foreman of the jury happened to be a member of our church. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. But I didn't know him. You didn't, didn't know me. him. <laughs> oh my gosh, John! That is unbelievable. So, 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 G, when, so Jesus, you know, a lot of people was like, uh, so John got a little religion. He has some faith. Okay, so maybe he hopes he won't, you know, go to hell. Maybe he'll go to heaven one day. What I'm hearing you say is that Jesus invades your life. He shows up in those moments and engages, has engaged you on so many different levels for these years. Is that fair yep. to say? Yep. And after this experience from, I went from not knowing him to becoming completely dependent. Mm. On well, some would say that's a sign of weakness, but you're saying actually it's a sign of strength. I mean, the Apostle Paul said, when I am weak, then I'm strong, right? In weakness, we're made strong. Is that? Yeah. Wow. So doing it your own way and having, I mean, John, I mean, you've had a, you've had a storybook life. I mean, think about it. I mean, playing golf, you know, on a weekly basis with Ben Hogan, surviving a plane crash, doing well in business, being a member to Gust. I mean, you know, you're the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. And if you put all that as a backdrop, would you say, as the Apostle Paul said, I consider that all rubbish to the surpassing value of knowing? Because you just said, I didn't know about him. I knew him. I knew Jesus. So what would you tell our friends watching this that maybe haven't taken a step with Jesus? What would, you, what would you be your thoughts on that? If they're lucky to do what I did, they would learn to lean on, a G, on Jesus like a post. Mm. which is what I've done. And continue to do. And continue to do. Yeah. Brother, I, I cannot thank you enough for sharing the story. I mean, I, I could sit here all day with John. I mean, you can tell I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a raving fan. But you told me something the other day. You were very clear. You were, I asked you, would you be willing to do this? And you thought about it, and you said, but I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about Jesus. And I hope everybody sensed that, that this is really a story where the hero is Jesus. And, and I think that's phenomenal. Um, we love you. <laughs> we love you and Shirley. Thank you. Um, thanks for sharing this. I think this will be precious. I think this is going to be something your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids are going to cherish as well. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, listen to your story today. And thank you for... Uh, tuning in, and uh, we look forward to being with you next time.